there's so many aspects of Ken. We all think we know him, but to sum them all up uh, would be very difficult. If you ask me what his political feelings are, I would say I haven't the slightest idea. Words have always been something that clearly came to him with ease. I still marvel at him. I watch him speak and his words just, just flow. When Ken would announce for NASCAR, he always used to say that these were ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And that's what I think about when I think about Ken. He's an ordinary person doing extraordinary things. But never, ever lost track of his roots. Worst driver in the world, on the planet, bar none. And he comes up with these harebrained schemes, and you know, nine out of 10 times they work. And that infuriates us even more. The only problem I really had with him is he likes my wife more than he likes me. When you get to know Ken Squire, uh, you get to know Vermont. Ken really is a Renaissance man. Ken Squire and I are the only two people whose careers have been so focused on motorsports who also have been chair of the board of our local symphonies. I rarely use this word to describe people in Vermont, but I would consider him a Vermont treasure. When I think about the people who have influenced my life the most, my wife, my parents, one teacher, and Ken. The question is, where would we be today without Ken Squire? Ken has never lost sight of his roots. And what ties together everything that he does is his sense of community. You know, they say that Vermont is what America was. Whether it's the radio stations, the VSO, Thunder Road, everything is built upon informality. It's built upon neighborliness. It's built upon community. In 1931, Waterbury truly was just a crossroads. It was a railroad station and Route 100 and Route 2 intersection, and that was about it. The editor and publisher of the Waterbury Record got this radio station assigned to the community of Waterbury, and that's when uh, Lloyd Squire, Ken's dad, the old Squire, came in and got involved and became an announcer. He was reading the news one day on the air and found out he'd become a daddy, and he said, I guess you'll have to call me the old Squire from now on, and the name stuck. Ken was born right around the corner from WDEV in what used to be an apartment building, and they were like on the second floor. And after doing all these things uh, uh, all around the world and the, and the sports and the Olympics, and he comes back here to Waterbury, and now that is the local funeral home. And he tells me, I'm probably the only guy I know that's gonna enter the world and leave the world from the same room. I've probably known Ken Squire as long as anybody in Vermont. My, my mother and father were good friends with his parents. We'd often drop by their house. I loved it because uh, Mrs. Squire was a great cook, but she could also be a tad strict. And she'd tell us, you wash your hands and you don't leave crumbs. And, yes, Mrs. Squire, yes, Mrs. Squire. He shadowed his dad, Lloyd, around the old fairground circuits where, you know, uh, Ken's dad would, would stand on the back of a flatbed truck with a microphone in hand and be the public address announcer. And Ken was indoctrinated to that at a very young age, eventually took over for his dad as the announcer, very young, and, and was just tremendous at that. He and Chris Economaki, the late Chris Economaki, were probably the two best of the barnstorming Northeastern race announcers that there ever were. My uncle had an association with Ken, and they built Thunder Road, and actually this Dubois construction that I currently own uh, built Thunder Road. But uh, I guess the, they did something on a handshake. My uncle did the work knowing that they didn't have the money to pay for it at that time, and that Ken had made a deal that uh, they would pay when they had money, which was every Thursday night. 
so they had the race at Thursday, on Thursday nights. So my uncle would go to the races, not to watch the races, but actually to get paid. So they get a certain cut of the gate. But the Thursday night thing is uh, something interesting as well. Barry is the granite center of the world, and all the stone cutters uh, would get paid on Thursdays. And so Ken would want to make sure that he got their first dollars before they had to make a, any other uh, uh, appropriations to their, their funds, uh, they, they, before they'd spend their money on, uh, on uh, food and everything else. Ken wanted to make sure he got his cut. This was a state-of-the-art racetrack. It was a third mile high bank, and it was filled all the time. All the Canadians would come down. You know, they'd had some nice modified cars, uh, people out of New York, uh, uh, the national people that were running for the national championships, like Bugsy Stevens, uh, Richie Evans, Jerry Cook, Dick Nephew, Charlie Trombley, all these people. They would come religiously every week. When you look at the great broadcasters in the history of television sports, the great ones create their own language, their special language that becomes part of the language of the sport. And Ken had that ability to come up with phrases, descriptions that lasted forever. And people would reference moments in a NASCAR race speaking squires. He would talk about something about sugaring off of a, of a tree or something, and I think it had something to do with maple syrup, and, and someone would sugar off something during a race, and no one in the world outside of Vermont had any idea what he, what he was talking about, but you know, Ken had a way with words, and somehow they figured all that out. A long time ago when we first started, there wasn't that many Yankees come down, done all their talking and stuff, so. He had a little bit different accent than what we did in North Carolina. And, uh, you know, from that standpoint, he kind of learned a little bit. You, you could tell if he'd been up there at home all the time, he really had an accent. After he'd come down here and stayed two or three weeks, his accent would get a little bit better. His accent was certainly uh, identifiable, but his line was good enough along the way that it covered up his Yankee, Yankee. and. Uh, so, you know, we, we had to love him anyway. He brought so many terms to the sport. The world center of racing, that was Ken's. That described Daytona. Ken came up with that term. He came up with uh, identifiers for drivers. If a driver went off a track too often, he went agricultural racing. He had, and Ken just had, a, had an incredible way with words. Ken was a great mentor, and uh, he was a guy that really taught me a lot. He called the Daytona 500 the Great American Race. A guy like him is really cool because he paints great pictures. Like, they're at the keyboard. They're working the keyboard as they come down off turn, and they're doing this, and they're doing that. I've been up to his little track in Vermont. I kissed the cow. I've done his radio show, the dump show they do in the morning. Uh, he's just a creative kind of a guy, visionary in a lot of ways, and a great friend. I grew up sitting in the grandstands at Thunder Road listening to Ken call short track races on the public address system. And there were, there were a million and twelve nicknames. You know, there was the Flying Fire Chief, then the Bethlehem Bombshell, then the Tampa Tornado, and the Irish Angel, Dick McCabe. And he just made things so colorful and so exciting. It didn't matter that the guy that won the feature tonight, tomorrow morning, was going to be changing oil at the Quickie Lube three blocks from where you lived. On that night at Thunder Road, man, he was as big as Bobby Orr, he was as big as Carl Yastrzemski, and it's because Ken made him that way. Nobody dreamed that it was possible. Nobody would have ever taken a chance on it. Ken Squire sold them on it. When we decided, when the executives at CBS decided to uh, go 
flag-to-flag -flag coverage of the Daytona 500, I don't think anybody really knew what we would get out of it. Would people tune in? What would the ratings be? Well, one thing that can help ratings on any sport on any given day is bad weather everywhere in the country but where the race is taking place. The following is a special report from the Channel 2 Newsroom. A devastating blizzard of winter that virtually strangled the city and left its citizens struggling to cope in over 20 inches of snow. And it snowed like crazy. And this voice that I had heard for years on the radio brings on the Daytona 500. 100,000 people on their feet watching these two cars galvanize to them, looking for any signs of distress from either automobile as they lap Buddy Arrington in the Tri-Oval. I was one of the many millions of New Englanders trapped by the blizzard, sitting at home captivated by this event. And I really feel like that's the first time I met Ken when he kind of came into my life. Stand by for a Two of the greatest fiddling here, fidgeting with first place, passing some of the strikers in the last lap, trying to take it home. It's all come down to this. We was running along there 20 seconds behind, racing with Daryl and AJ and uh, the race was up front. Out of turn two, Donnie Allison in first. Where will Kale make his move? He comes to the inside. Donnie Allison throws the block. Kale hits him. He slides. Donnie Allison slides. They hit again. They drive into the turn. They're hitting the wall. They're head on the wall. They slide down to the inside. Let's watch those third place cars. They're out of it. Who is going to win it? Coming down, third place. They're coming around for the finish between A.J. Boyd and Richard Petty. All of a sudden, uh, we, they crashed, and we wound up going from third to first. I mean, we didn't do anything. We didn't pass anybody. We didn't do nothing. The other guys just got out of the way. So it was a, kind of an odd situation when you, when you really get down to it, but we, we happened to be on the winning end of that. Coming down, Richard Petty is now pulling out in front. Darrell Waltrip is in second. A.J. Slingshot. Petty is out in front at the line. Walter to the inside. Petty wins it. When Kale Yarbrough and Donnie Allison started crashing on the back straightaway, Ken called that event explicitly. I mean, literally, blow by blow. A $60,000 car becoming a 22 passenger school bus. But those words that will forever live in everyone's memory, the words that he uttered that were heard around the world. And there's a fight. Richard Petty, the great master, has just recorded his 186th career. And, and there's a fight between Cale Yarborough and Donnie Allison. The tempers overflowing. They're angry. They know they have lost. And what a bitter defeat. Twin Valley Wildcats versus the Danville Indians. Then at 3.30, it's a uh, boys division two. I was hired in 1982 as the copywriter for WDEV. And Ken comes up to my cubicle and he said, how do you pronounce the name of the road that runs through Waterbury? And I said, Route 100. And he said, what's the color of a stop sign? Red. Okay, how do you spell red, R-E-D? And what's the last three letters in the word hundred? And I said, red, R-E-D. And he had me write the word red and put it up on the wall. And he had me write the word 100 and put it up on the wall. And every day he'd come up and we'd do this little exercise of red and 100. <music> Here's this guy that is uh, sort of a national icon in stock car racing, and he's now, his career has peaked, and he's starting to do less of the national stuff. He becomes chairman of the Vermont Symphony Orchestra. He is involved with so many different things. My Wheels for Warmth, he's been a tremendous help in trying to develop that charity program. And anything he can do for the average Vermonter and making sure that they are helped in, in some way, Ken is there to make sure that happens. Vermont is uh, near and dear to his heart.
If I couldn't come back to my farmhouse in Middlesex, walk on the dirt road, I feel I lost a part of myself. I think Ken's the exact same way.